This week on Writers Inc. I must have had about 15 friends emailing me saying, oh, have you seen this competition? Why don't you enter it? And when I read up about it, um, there was very sort of strict deadlines of, right, you need to submit your first 10,000 words by this date. And then if you're shortlisted, we need the whole novel by the end of the year. And I was just kind of like, this is what I need because I could still be writing that book now. Sweet Little Lies, my first book. I probably would have still still be writing it now. Um, if, if, if it wasn't for that competition. So I just thought, right, that's brilliant. This will give me a deadline. Um, and I, so I submitted the first 10,000 words. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the best seller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out, school's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hi, it's Christine Dagle. Patrick O'Donnell. J.P. Reinflush. Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writers, Inc. Um, Patrick, you got the, the exclusive on some 20 book stuff, didn't you? I did. I sat down with Joe Solari and interviewed him on my latest Cops and Writers podcast. And I, I'm really excited. I think these changes are going to be really cool. He's probably one of the biggest things is he's really trying hard to bring in readers. Kind of, you know, I've never been to Thriller Fest. Obviously, you know, others have that are here. And it's kind of a reader slash writer conference. You know, the beginning of the conference is going to be exclusively for writers. And then he's going to integrate the readers, you know, where you can actually like talk to people that are reading your book. You have fans, you know, et cetera. So I think it's it's a big plus and I think it's going to work out really well. It was a lot of fun talking to him. Yeah, we should probably mention like because you didn't you didn't actually say it, but the the whole point is that Joe has bought the 20 books Vegas conference and is turning it into author nation. Yes. Oh yeah. I, I, I sort of assume anybody listening to us at this point knows, knows all that, but <laughs> yeah, we can yeah, assume, right. we, we could probably assume everyone knows, <laughs> but for those, right. the three of you listening who did not know that that's, that's what's happening. So Joe Solari's bought already bought the 20 books Vegas conference and is turning it into a conference called author nation. I was really excited to see his presentation at 20 books and especially the announcement that uh that kevin smith is going to be a, a keynote yep. for that it's he's host where they're hosting one of the evening with kevin smith things which is like kevin smith's new sideline of business where he does a whole presentation talk thing he's funny he's a very funny speaker if you haven't seen him well if they're trying to bring in more readers that makes a lot more sense now you know because like when i yeah. first heard kevin smith like he's i'm sure he's got books i'm sure he's done that kind of thing because he does everything but um you know this this makes a lot of sense because he's going to bring in a decent sized crowd for that and honestly like the, the book festival that i w just attended in dubai um you know like it's geared towards readers first uh and but they they have a very similar format you know a lot of, a lot of stuff towards the readers but then there's also panels uh, specific to writers uh and they have a couple million people that come through there every year um, you know, I, I literally saw families pushing shopping carts filled with books that they bought at the conference. It, it, they're just that into it. But um, yeah, I mean, you can you can draw some huge crowds when you start bringing in the fan base. That's what he's doing next cool. year. Yeah. Yes. All right. JP, what's in the news? All right. First up in the news, uh, there was an article called, Is the Campus Novel Dead? Uh, so modern campus novels are shifting to reflect the realities of Gen Z students who face challenges like student debt, part-time jobs, and non-traditional education paths, diverging from the traditional campus novel, uh, cloistered, idealized portrayal of camp college life. Today's campus novels are addressing financial pressures, uh, the necessity of working while studying, uh, and the experience of non-traditional students, uh, such as those who drop out and return, um, and those who commute rather than living on campus. Um, overall, I found this um, article interesting because what it really reflects is whenever you're writing towards an age group, if you're always writing in that bracket of age group, you almost have to consider what that generation looks like as it shifts into it. Um, so this just made me think um, about not only campus novels, but you know, if you wanted to switch to young adult or even middle grade, uh, how that changes over time. I, I first saw this and I'm not going to lie. I thought it said Krampus and I started going to the, that, the scary <laughs> monster you see around Christmas Those time. Those do exist. <laughs> I'm sure they, I'm sure they do it they're, they're probably haunting college students um 
Yeah, I mean, this this is definitely interesting. It, it's funny because, you know, like I'm 52. It's been a long time since I was in college. But like a lot of these bullet points, like the things that they're talking about are still similar to you know, the same headaches that we had back in the day. Yep. I mean, all everybody I knew, we we were all working two or three jobs, um, you know, living off campus because nobody could really afford to live on campus at the time um, and trudging back and forth. You know, like you couldn't really drive because there's not enough, enough room for parking and all, all that stuff. Um yeah, so that, that really hasn't changed. But I think, honestly, like the urgency of it all has, like the, the pressure on these kids, I think, is much greater than it was at the, the time when, when we had to go through it. Um, I, I, you know, it's funny back then, I, I never read a book about that particular topic, you know, like financial debt, like while I was in school, like they didn't talk about all that. And I'm kind of glad to see it um, because I rang up a ton of student loan debt. You know, yeah. like they, they push that on you. Like yep. you walk through the door and it's like, oh, you can qualify for this grant and for that grant and you can max out this loan with that and you can use your, your loan to pay your rent and pick up, you know, get some of your food and it's like by the time you leave college you've you know, like you've got no clue what you're actually doing from a credit standpoint until you know that first bill shows up and you've got to pay that back so just the idea of them talking about this in advance i think is huge yeah i like that a lot i'll be i'm gonna confess i had never heard the phrase campus novel i don't I didn't right. know that was a thing uh until seeing this so but i i agree with jd like i i wish i'd had something that that i could have read as a guide of sorts uh because you know i came out I came out with a lot of student loans. I went to a private <laughs> university, so I, I owed a lot of money just coming out. But then I was only able to make the minimum payment for, for several years and ended up owing like twice as much as what I took out in loans. So, yeah, that's a trap. Nobody needs yeah. college. Don't go to college. Well, oh, okay. Well, We're just going to jump right into that. Some, I, I might as well jump in and say that now. <laughs> But you know what? For Grab me, the tinfoil hats, everybody. Yeah, but for me, I worked full time and went to college full time. I don't suggest that for anyone, but I walked out of that college with zero student debt, zero, and I paid for all of it myself. You know, you can do it. You know, I was like, oh, you're not getting the college experience. Yeah, okay, whatever. I had plenty of college experience. I had lots of fun, and I also flunked out twice. And came back because I was partying way too hard and working full time and doing all that. But you know what? I still got my degree and I walked out without any debt. My roommates took out loans. They had cool stereos. They went on spring break. They used all the money for the shit that they shouldn't have. You know, that's that's what I saw. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what this article's. I think that's what this article suggests, though, is that there are students nowadays that, you know, they drop out and return and that they're doing this work while they're in college. But you're yeah. still as the incredible increase of college goes up to like five, six figures, uh, it becomes un unintendable or unattainable. Um, so yeah. addressing that early so that hopefully some students can get out of that trap. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what you said too, like the cost of um, college right now is way more than it was, and the cost of real estate apartments is way more. So, I don't know, even working a good job that you can come out of college now without debt. So, yeah, get yourself a van yeah. down by the river, down by the river. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, but but here's the thing, you know, when I was going to college, when I left, it was a little over a thousand dollars, you know a semester i my kid just graduated two years yeah. ago and That's it's amazing about ten thousand dollars a little over ten it's a state school yeah it's not private yeah. and yeah it's gone up but so have wages and if he worked full-time he wouldn't have any debt simple as that next in the news yeah <laughs> <laughs> College is for um, chumps. That's the, <laughs> that's the moral. Agree <laughs> to disagree. <laughs> Next in the news, um, self-publishing news. Audiobooks continue to increase market share. The audiobook market has seen significant and continuous growth from 2017 to 2022, with sales increasing from $1.03 billion to $1.85 billion, outpacing the overall publishing industry's growth. Uh, the advent of AI-trained digital narration and platforms like KDP and Google Play Books are making it easier for more cost-effective uh, approaches for authors to create those high-quality audiobooks. Uh, with the rise of digital narration, uh, there are concerns about the future of voice artists in the audiobook industry, also highlighting the unexplored potential um, as over 90% of ebook titles currently lack audio versions. Um, so this was just another interesting thing about this market of audiobooks is clearly seeing a lot of growth um, 
And yeah, I think that uh, this is something that I definitely need to approach more of uh, in my own indie sphere, but I just wanted to see your guys' input. Yeah, I was just playing with um, Eleven Labs last night because I trained it with my voice and I'm I'm trying to start using that to, to narrate some mostly like the short stories and novellas and things like that. Uh, and I, it's it's not going to be easy because there's like a 5,000 character limit per session, I guess. Uh, and so I'm going to actually hire a VA to just kind of sit and do that tedious work, copy, paste, save the files and do all that stuff for me. Uh, but it's still going to be even with paying a VA uh, and paying like the highest rate on 11 labs, it's still going to cost me less, less than producing even one audiobook with a human narrator. But my goal is like, I've got 70 plus titles and a hundred plus shorts that I need narrated. Like, and my goal is to get those done without having to, you know, take out another student loan level loan. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I think you're going to back see, around. Sure. You're going <laughs> to see this market get seriously saturated because, you know, right now, like it's, it's still cost prohibitive, I think, for most people to create an audio book. And that's kind of been the case. And there's just a fraction of audio books released every year versus the number of books. Um, but all those books that don't have audio books are just sitting there on the shelves. Um, authors just like you, you know, they're looking at that back catalog and they're like, hey, I've got 22 books out here. I've only got one audio book. I can create another 21 and it's going to be way cheaper to do it. So you're going to see that market get flooded with with material. Um, that being said, like a lot more people are still listening to audiobooks, And honestly, I think it's become because it's become a little bit more acceptable to walk through life with headphones on. Um, you know, whereas, if, you know, years, years back, you couldn't do it, you know, not, not really people will give you a hard time. Uh, but my sister, she runs a hospital down in Florida and she said that half her staff, they wear heads, you know, head earbuds, like pretty much all day long. Um, you know, unless they're actually interacting with patients and they're listening to audiobooks or they're listening to music. Um, you know, you walk through an airport and, you know, you, you see a lot more people doing that same kind of thing. So it's just, I think it's becoming one of those things, you know, I'm, I'm going from point A to point B, I'm going to throw my headset on and I'm going to listen to something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, uh, when I worked in the uh, lab, I had, I had no reason to talk to anybody. So I had eight hours a day. I was listening to audiobooks. I listened to the wheel of time and like the whole wheel of time in like two months. Um, yeah. and, uh, it's just so easily attainable for certain, certain tasks to be able to listen to something while you're doing something else. Yeah. So, um, I would say without audiobooks, I, half of what I, even greater than half of what I consider to have read, I would never have been able to. Last in the news, <laughs> uh, small publishers are sweeping the Booker and Noble prizes. Uh, so independent publishers like uh, One World and Grove Atlantic, despite their small size, are increasingly winning prestigious literary awards, such as the B Booker Prize, um, demonstrating their ability to compete with larger publishing houses. Um, so Penguin Random House, you know, the big four in Britain, the big five in America, they dominate the market, but don't always translate their size uh, to those uh, award winning literary quality. Uh, independent publishers tend to prioritize quality over profitability, um, often accepting the lower profit margins in exchange for publishing more challenging or less commercially driven titles. Um, so I found this interesting overall, especially as someone who is uh, going and looking at what kind of awards that I could apply for. Uh, and so I, I thought this was interesting to see that independent publishers sort of sweep over the, the big five. I think one of the things that's happening here too is just it's becoming more acceptable to be an indie publisher or a small press. Like, you know, if you go back to some of these awards five or ten years ago, if you know, if the if you did not recognize the name of the publisher, chances are the book wouldn't even make it in. And yeah. and nowadays, you know, it's it's the opposite. You know, you you're, you see one Penguin Random House title and you see fifteen or twenty other ones that you don't technically know. Um, you know, it's just it's becoming more mainstream for for small presses and individuals to just put out product. And you know, the closer we get to that becoming the norm, uh, the more acceptable this kind of thing's going to be too. Yeah. I think what's interesting though, is if you look back far enough in some of these prizes, like the Nobel independent publishing was what publishing was when some of them started. So it's kind of interesting to see that loop back around uh, and, and see these, see that respect come back for, for that group. We, we lived in a long time for a long time. We lived in this world where uh, the idea of independent publishing or self publishing was kind of taboo and, you know, those who can uh, get a publishing deal and those who can't self-publish. And that was kind of the idea. But man, with uh, with the way things have been trending, I mean, it's it. there's been a real title shift on that. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. 
With that, JD, who is up this week? This week, we've got Kaz Freer. She's an international bestselling author of Sweet Little Lies, and her latest book is called Five Bad Deeds and releases December 5th. Here she is, Kaz Freer. So you have a new book, Five Bad Deeds, which is a domestic suspense novel whose main character, Ellen, has done something very, very bad, but she just doesn't know what it is. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that sums it up pretty well. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit more about the book? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the character of Ellen, who you mentioned, she, um, she kind of... Um, sees herself as you know a one of life's good people so she's sort of you know she's one of these people that would always be the first to offer a lift to anyone um or to volunteer to do something she's just you know she's she's just kind of a good person um so when things start to go pretty wrong for her um and then she gets um she gets a, a letter in the post basically saying to her that um, she needs to learn that there are consequences to her actions. She is just genuinely baffled. She just can't really think of what she could have possibly done. She's not a saint and she's certainly not set up as a saint from the start, but she just can't possibly imagine what she could have done um, to, to, yeah, kind of incur the wrath of this enemy. And so The Five Bad Deeds is really about how she has to start looking back on her past and sort of thinking about maybe some of the unintentional things. And, and that's that's kind of what the book is about, how even though we might perceive ourselves to be good people, and, you know, it, it may be very much the case that, you know, we'd never intentionally cause anybody any harm. Sometimes the, the decisions that we make on impulse or sometimes just the selfish decisions that we make can have really big impact on other people's lives and we don't necessarily know. So that, that the five bad deeds, and I'm not kind of, you know, I wouldn't be giving anything away by saying this, but there's not less, there isn't that sort of thing that you get in thrillers where, you know, she's hiding that she committed this awful crime. She killed someone in, a you know, 15 years ago or anything. They are all sort of relatively small things, but they unknowingly had a big impact on, on the people around her. Yeah. What a horrible position to be in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, to oh. around on eggshells thinking, like, oh God. What did I do? And what you did do was surprising, but I'm not going to spoil that. So uh, what number of book is this for you now that you've published? So this is the fourth. The so fourth the one. The first three were a detective series. So all the same. Yeah. All the same right. characters. So this and this is the one's first a standalone, standalone. The fourth book. Awesome. And how did you get your start writing? Um, I had a bit of a, a bit of an odd start, really. Um, you know, I, I probably the traditional had always been writing on and off and huge reader. But um, there's a competition in the UK um, called Search for a Bestseller that's um, done in conjunction with WH Smith, which is one of our sort of bigger probably not quite a Waterstones, but it's just underneath that. It's one of our biggest UK um, book retailers. And yeah, they have this competition called Search for a Bestseller. Um, and it was just the second year that they'd run it. Um, and because I'd sort of always been talking about writing and writing, but talking about it a lot, <laughs> um, I must have had about 15 friends emailing me saying, oh, have you seen this competition? Why don't you enter it? And when I read up about it, um, there was very sort of strict deadlines of, right, you need to submit your first 10,000 words by this date. And then if you're shortlisted, we need the whole novel by the end of the year. And I was just kind of like, this is what I need because I could still be writing that book now. Sweet Little Lies, my first <laughs> book. I probably would have still still be writing it now um, if, if, I, if it wasn't for that competition. So I just thought, right, that's brilliant. This will give me a deadline. Um, and I, so I submitted the first 10,000 words. Um, and I'd... I, I'd done a creative writing course with a, a big literary agency. I sort of knew it was decent and I was really, really hoping that maybe I'd get shortlisted or that I might just get some sort of email from the judges going, you know, you're on the right track this, you know, not this time, but you're on the right track, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, to cut a long story short, I won. So it was, it was a really, um, it was a bit of a crazy time. So I found out I won in January um, and the book was on the shelves in June, which is, you know, I mean, gosh, the time yeah. for five bad deeds has been that nearly 18 months, I think. 
Um, so yeah, to sort of, and that was the first draft I submitted in the January. Wow. And so you didn't have it written. You had to write it that year just for <laughs> the competition. Yeah. So wow. I submitted, I submitted 10,000 words in May, found out in June that I'd been shortlisted. I think there was eight of us on the shortlist and then all of the shortlisted um, writers had to um, submit by December, the entire book. Um, and then, yeah, they announced in January. So it was all a bit crazy. And like I say, it was kind of five months till the book was on the shelves. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So you had to um, write fast and it was out fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly, and ever since then, you know, you'll know yourself, you know, publishing is quite a waiting game and mm-hmm. it can be sort of very, very fast and then nothing happens and then very, very fast again. Whereas this was just like constant. So I had to almost readjust from my second book onwards to actually how publishing works. Yeah. So that is, so you've entered this competition. You don't have an agent, I'm assuming at that point. No, I I kind of won my agent you in won the competition your- <laughs> and we've been, she's fabulous. She's brilliant. Um, so that was part of the, it was a book deal and that you could sign with this wonderful agent called Eugenie Furness. Um, and yeah, we've, we've been together ever since. Wow. And did you have uh, many unfinished or half finished books before that? Or was this kind of your first book? I I had finished a novel before um, in a different genre. It was it was I suppose you'd call it women's fiction, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I finished, and that got me an agent. This was probably three or four years before um, I went down the search for the bestseller route. But yeah, it got me an agent, but it went out on submission, and sadly, it didn't get picked up. It actually went out on submission the week that Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, not a good week. (laughs) No. So it was basically, it was pretty much, yeah, if if it wasn't a bit filthy, publishers weren't interested. (laughs) They were just like, we just want more of that. Um, So, so yeah, it's, yeah, publishing, a lot of it's about timing and luck, isn't it? Timing and trends and and you can't uh, write to a trend, but you can be lucky to be on trend and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, that's great. So were you working full time when that happened, when you were writing this book and you were right, like a pretty stressful job when you wrote this? Yeah, book? I was, um, I worked, yeah. So I worked in London in the city working as a headhunter. So I was recruiting into investment banks. Um, when I got shortlisted, I dropped down to part time. They were brilliant. They were really, really supportive of that because to get the book written mm-hmm. by December, um, I just thought I can't, yeah, I can't be doing, I, I know, I know brilliant authors that can do that sort of, you know, half an hour, bang out a thousand words on the commute, but you know, we all write in really different ways and I'm not one of those people. So, um, they were really, really supportive and I went down to part time while I wrote it. Um, okay. and then it came out in 2017 and then I went full time then oh, full time nice. author. Yeah. So you're full time author now. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. And so uh, you said you've been writing on and off for a long time. Did you study any other authors? And if you did, what did you kind of learn from them that you've brought to your own work? Yeah, um, I did. And I like almost to the point of I've still got it now. And some, you know, when I've met a few of these authors since they're a bit stunned when I tell them that. um, So Tana French was like, my all time in the woods is kind of, you know, everyone has the book that they wish that they wrote. Um, And I could, like, I could probably write a thesis on in the woods. I've (laughs) literally broken it down. And so I did that with a lot of, um, when I knew that I really wanted to develop within the crime and thriller space, I took about 10 of my favorite books and sort of broke them down to try and understand, um, okay, why does this work? Why did it, what is it that keep that's keeping the pages turning? Um, and I had at the time, it was all in Excel where I would literally break it down of this is what happens in this chapter, how I'm feeling about the characters, what they're doing, where the cliffhangers are coming. Um, and I, yeah, it was kind of a sort of forensic breakdown. So ta- my two sort of main um, influences, I guess, a ton of French and also Linda Laplante. And they're sort of two weird influences because they're completely different writers, yeah. like completely. Um, but in some ways that really works because I think Tana French is so good on character and atmosphere. 
Whereas Linda LaPlante is just a really good plot storyteller. You know, one of those where you sit down and think, oh, I'll just read the first couple of chapters and then you've read half the book and <laughs> it's time because she she just knows how to keep a story moving along. Whereas I think with Tana French, it's just more, you can, you just savour the prose. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I've sort of got a melting pot of those two and they're, they're kind of the, yeah, the two main ones I, I looked up to. Nice. I like that. So you just kind of broke them down in a spreadsheet. What happens? Yeah. How am I feeling about the character? Where are the cliffhangers? And you just kind of repeated that yeah. over and over again. To yeah. Get a feel for it. I think yeah. with, with crime and mystery, um, you know, you will always find that you're going off, you will go off on a tangent. Um, and, and I am a real plotter, but I think there is maybe more than other genres but maybe I'm wrong because I'm just so crime focused but I think there is that contract with the reader that they expect certain things to happen Mm. at certain points um and particularly for my first three when I was writing police procedural um you know yes you want your character to feel original and the voice needs to be fresh etc but ultimately there is a detectives will arrive at the crime scene there will be a post-mortem they will interview you know but there are certain things that um you know people play with the genre and that's great but I think there is a bit of a contract of yeah you pick up a police procedural you know what you're getting so that actually all the sort of studying on that side served me well because I felt like right I know how to craft this I can concentrate more on the characters and and really trying to enrich those yeah I love that so you kind of know your structure and then you can be more creative within it with the character and the voice and great so with the current book what made you decide to do domestic suspense um I think it's kind of what I read I suppose. I mean, I do. I, I read lots of police procedurals as well, but I, I wrote there are and that there are brilliant authors who've written ten books with the same characters, and I love them for it because you know exactly what you're getting. But I do. After three, I was a little bit sort of, yeah. I just wanted to do try something different, mm-hmm. um, and even though with my main character, my main detective character there's lots of sort of dysfunctional stuff going on with her relationship with her father that you could take through an entire series, but it was that, okay, do I want to go back to, they arrive at the crime scene. They have the, po- it, it, it just kind of, and I certainly would go back to doing that, but at the time I just kind of thought I want to try something a little bit different. Um, and one of the main things was that my detective series was set in London where I used to live Um and I wanted with the domestic suspense almost just to create my own world. So the village in Five Baddies is totally made up. Um, and it just felt like it just felt like more of a creative endeavor. Whereas with the detective series, it was very much I spent half my life on Street View and Google Maps, just making sure <laughs> that my photography was OK. And probably half an hour to an hour a day checking in with um, a couple of police guys they they do happen to be guys that I know making sure that you know what I was writing was authentic and yeah um, so to actually just kind of go right I'm gonna create this world and there is there is a police officer and there is a crime in five bad deeds obviously so there was a little bit of that but it just felt a bit more freeing after three sort of standard procedurals yeah, nice. Yeah, because you do have to get those procedurals right or your readers will oh. let you know, right? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and it, it's a tricky one to to balance because I got, I really struck lucky with one of the police officers that I work with that he really got that it's fiction. So he would be kind of, he would always say to me, what do you need to happen? And I'll sort of see if I can think of a way that we could make that happen without, you know, me wanting to throw the book across the room because it's so, you know, a, a, really that a murder, a murder investigation is a very slow, mm-hmm. often quite laborious process and nobody wants to read about that. So you have to, yeah, you have yeah. to sort of, you know, take, is it yeah. artistic license? Is that? Absolutely. A, no one yeah. would want to read a real courtroom drama either. It would just be no. so Oh boring. God, can you imagine? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's things like, you know, getting blood tests or DNA tests back in procedurals. Mm-hmm. You know, they take weeks. Yeah. But by talking to the police officers, they were sort of like, well, you can get it back in 24 hours, but it will cost half your budget, half your budget, but just make a reference to the fact that it's costing a lot for them to do it. And that's fine. It makes it at least seem authentic then. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I know an awful lot more than, <laughs> than I did four years ago, let's just say. Awesome. And so you've called your main character in this novel and in other novels an every woman. What do you enjoy Mm. about writing that type of character? Um, I suppose because it just means I can draw from (laughs) people. (laughs) Yeah, nobody's safe talking around me. Um, And again, I think with most authors, it comes back to what you want to, what you enjoy reading. And I think I like my main character I wouldn't say my heroine because I wouldn't necessarily call Ellen a heroine um she's not an anti-heroine but um yeah I I kind of like them to be real and flawed rather than yeah sort of an out and out villain or the heroine of the piece um and that's kind of what I mean by an every woman I don't necessarily mean someone that everybody will love because I don't think everyone will love Ellen. I think everybody, or I hope that people will find something to relate to in her, yeah. but they don't necessarily have to like her. That's not, she wasn't necessarily written that way. Right. I think that's what it means. Like they're relatable. Do you have any secrets for kind of making that type of character relatable? You said that you make her flawed. Um. Yeah. Concentrating on flaws, but I, just I think being honest you know there are and there's certainly things with Ellen and some of the things that she says that I'd be writing and then I think oh god does that sound a little bit catty does that sound a bit bitchy a bit below the belt but then I think but you know I can think of 10 friends or whatever who would probably come out with that Mm -hmm. and because I write in the first person it is almost like it's a confessional so she's talking to the reader so she can't really hide that part of herself if she's yeah. thinking a mean thought or if she's angry about something or, you know, whatever. It sort of needs to come out or the character doesn't feel real. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've even my detective novels I wrote in the first person as well. It's just the way that my writing comes out. Um, I've tried to write in the third person, but I always find quite, I find, and I love reading in the third person, but I just find when I write in the third person, it feels a bit, it doesn't feel natural to me. I feel a little bit detached from the character. Yeah, it can feel more distant, right? It's harder to get in close when you're in third person. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's probably the most popular or the most common (laughs) form, isn't it? Um, And some people passionately don't like the first person and it's tri- And it's tricky because if you write in the first person, the reader, I think, kind of has to like the character to a degree mm-hmm. because it's almost like somebody's just shouting at you for 300 pages. Yeah. And if you don't <laughs> like that, if you don't like being in that character's head, then it is going to be quite, yeah, quite testing. Yeah. For sure. I think it's changing a little bit, though. I think we're seeing more first person. So maybe we'll see a shift with younger readers. I don't know. I think so. But yeah, it probably, you're right, actually. That sort of, oh no, first person is a bit of an old fashioned view now, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I've, I've taught a creative writing course and just from, you know, talking to anybody that wants to write, they always sort of say, how do you decide what, you know, who, what perspective you're going to write from? And I always just say, it's not really a decision. It's just how it comes out. Yeah. I, God, it sounds very arty farty, doesn't it? It's like <laughs> I have to be that character. If I'm not, if I, there is just like this sort of detachment. Yeah. Um, and in doing that, I think that's where you can you can get that relatable side to the character because you're being honest about how you would I mean Ellen isn't me in so many different ways, not in her life setup. I don't have kids, I don't, you know, all these, that character is not me but if you write in the first person it you your personality does bleed into the character a little bit I think and that's not necessarily a 
problem as long as it's not yeah you know overwhelming yeah yeah um another thing that i found interesting in your book is that you did uh one character's point of view in whatsapp <laughs> oh yeah yeah can you tell us a little bit about that? Was that fun? Was it difficult? What was your thought process, uh, including that? Yeah, it was really good fun. I loved writing those. And it was weird because, as I just said, I don't have kids. I don't have a teenage daughter. I've got teenage nieces now. But actually, when I first started writing the book, they were a little bit younger. So I was there was this sort of like, oh, God, am I getting the voice right? Um it just the reason I did it as, as WhatsApp, I just there are so many points of view in the book mm -hmm. I just thought that doing well she's a teenage girl and they live on whatsapp so it felt authentic in that sense but also it gets to the point quite quick yeah you're not and because she appears in other people's chapters that rounds her out a little bit but I just thought it was almost you see again you see it in procedurals sometimes where people and um, will just have the the actual interview transcript so you can just relay the information quite quickly um, but I also thought it was just a good way for teenage girls to be teenage girls because it's two teenage girls talking to each other. So they're going to be fairly unfil unfiltered and say things that they wouldn't, you know, necessarily yeah. say in front of their parents or, or whatever. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to read. You. And that's a good point. Those type of sections do um, have real fast pacing, right? You're right in it yeah. and it moves it right along. Yeah. Um, you also have, have talked about that this book has themes of moral ambiguity, self-preservation, and social class. Mm. How do you handle theme in your work? I'm always curious about that with writers. Do you think about that? Is it an afterthought? It's always an afterthought. I don't think you ever know what the themes of a novel are until you've actually written it. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know, maybe some authors would say differently that they they would sit down sort of thinking, I want to write a novel about revenge or justice or whatever whereas yeah I always think until you're on your second draft you never really know what the book's about until you're on the second draft you know what the plot is and you know who did it and you know all those things but you don't really know what you're trying to say about the world mm -hmm. if that makes sense until yep. later um so yeah it's it's not really something that I started off I, I knew that I sort of wanted to to explore this idea of what is a good person because none of us are all good and not many people are all bad either <laughs> um so I, I sort of had that as a loose theme I suppose and and things grew out of it and I'm just always really um the, the social class thing comes up in my detective novels as well I just I just find that sort of whole thing fascinating and Brits I think are more obsessed with class maybe I just find that whole thing of is your class the class you're born in is it the class you, you, is it sort of your economic class as an adult can you ever sort of outrun who you are as a child it, you know doesn't matter how wealthy you become as an adult if you were that sort of you know poor school kid do you always carry a little bit of that with you um I find all that fascinating so it kind of creeps in to my writing whatever I'm writing detective novels <laughs> or domestic thrillers there's always characters that have sort of crossed the social classes that's definitely a timeless theme you know <laughs> so yeah uh, so you're writing full time now and you like the deadlines. It's Was it any different writing under contract than that first novel? Oh, or? God, so different. <laughs> <laughs> so different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do I like deadlines? <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose I do because I'm, I edit as I go along. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I could I could spend a year writing a chapter if if that was, <laughs> if that was allowed <laughs> and going back over it and back over. It. I'm getting better in that sense, but um, I need deadlines, <laughs> I suppose, rather than than like them. But then at the same time, and I was probably the same way at school, you know, handing in pieces of homework mm -hmm. and revising for exams. You could give me two years and I would still be at 11.59 the night before finishing it's just I, it doesn't feel like it at the time but I think I actually write maybe better under pressure and maybe there's like sort of an urgency mm -hmm. <laughs> that comes out in the writing um 
because yeah, I can spend I can spend months writing my first few chapters, and I could spend a week writing the ending. And obviously, then it's edited and edited and edited. But you've sort of hit your stride by the time you're in that last ten percent of the novel, where it, it, you know the words are sort of flying out, whereas they can feel like pulling teeth yeah. when you first start. Yeah. So what's been surprising or difficult for you about being a full-time author? It could be whatever, contracts, writing, marketing, anything. Um, gosh, probably a bit of everything. Um, <laughs> I think it is the, the idea, you know, when, when I was working, you would sort of go, right, I have a two hour window now. And you would just sit and you would get it done. And I, I think I had that laser focus, whereas now, you know, when you get when you get um, your contract and it's right, your deadline for the second book in your contract is July 2025. And that just seems so far away that it, you, you need a huge amount of self-motivation, I guess. And I have that. I used to work in sales and worked on commission and et cetera. So I, I've always had to be able to motivate myself. But going from that frantic kind of how I came into the business with the competition to then everything to having to sort of readjust to long lead times within publishing has been has been challenging. And I think, yeah, marketing is I'm not a natural marketing type person. I'm very you can probably see I can chat for England, but I'm not a sort of put myself out there. Um but I think I've accepted that now. The first couple of years, I'd sort of see people that were brilliant on social media and feel like, oh, I should be doing these. I should be doing a reel every day. I should try and understand TikTok. I should try and, whereas now I'm just like, no, maybe pick one thing. Instagram kind of a bit more my thing and just yeah. stick with that. So there's just, there's just so much, isn't there, that you don't realize before you start writing. Yeah. It's, it's also like running a small business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Instagram is the kind of thing that you do for marketing or promotion. That's kind of your Yeah. Thing. I mean, gosh, when I say it's that, that's probably my thing. I mean, it's probably the one that I'm best at. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm no, by no means a, a Instagram um, whiz or anything. But yeah, probably it's, it's the one that I like the most. I used to like Twitter or X or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I think like most people, it's, yeah, it's not necessarily the place it was five years ago. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just such a shift from you write your first book, you don't know anything about the industry, you're just writing and you write thinking, you know, I'm loving doing this and maybe no one will ever read it to going into kind of, right, I've got to write this book and I've read all these reviews of my previous books and they're, I don't, I don't really read reviews Ooh, anymore yeah. <laughs> I'm the occasional one but whereas before I used to seek them out now I'm just kind of like no you write the book you put it into the world some people will like it some people won't that's all fine great great and uh as we're wrapping up I just want to ask one last question mm -hmm. if you could offer advice to new and aspiring writers what would it be um it's it sounds really obvious but it, just that finish the first draft don't worry if it feels if it is terrible it's not terrible <laughs> we all think the first draft is terrible but just get to the end because you know as we mentioned before things like characterization and themes and the stuff that make your novel really rich they generally don't come to the second draft anyway just get the plot down and don't necessarily worry about it, you know, feeling like it's going to be this award-winning novel. It's just about getting the plot down and then you can go back. Because I know myself, I, yeah, I could, as I've said, I could, I could spend years on one thing and I have to just push myself forward to get, to get it finished. I edit, I do still edit as I go, but far less than I used to. It's just, it's never... The way you imagine the scene in your head is never the way it comes out on the page. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> it was so good in my head. So this book we are talking about is Domestic Suspense. I'm curious, what do you think that is? Like, how would you describe Domestic Suspense? 
I mean, the, the first one I know of is Gone Girl, right? Yeah. And, and that kind of set the trend for, for this type of novel. I was thinking it was stories about things like uh, who forgot to empty the dishwasher or <laughs> why are the trash bags still in there? <laughs> Perfect reasons for murder. <laughs> so um, Kaz had written police procedurals before this and then said she wrote this book because domestic suspense is something she enjoys reading. So I'm curious, do you write what you enjoy reading the most or do you write outside the genres you usually read? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing it, it, it kind of depends um you know I, I i do a lot of work for hire like the co-authored stuff that i do with patterson and you know it's not necessarily going to be the, the next book i absolutely want to write um but you know I, I never write anything i don't want to write i guess would be the flip side to that I might, I might be on the fence about the idea but you know once i, I start and i get into it I'm, I'm all in yeah this has been kind of a weird i wouldn't call it a problem per se but like this is, my tastes have shifted since i started writing and i'm I still enjoy the stories that I've written and, and, and I still kind of enjoy coming up with those, those plots, but I'm starting to kind of shift towards wanting to write something different. Uh, and, and, and I find myself reading that kind of stuff a lot now. So I guess the answer really is yes. Like I, I just haven't done the deep dive yet and started writing the things that I'm reading. <laughs> Not yet, but I think I'm headed that way. Yeah. Well, I think you have to ask yourself, why are you, why are you writing? You know, is, are you trying to make a living? Then you can't be blind to tropes and trends, et cetera, that, you know, you have voracious readers and you kind of go that way, or you just want to do like a passion project that you feel strongly about, but probably won't sell a whole lot, but it'll make you happy and maybe a handful of people or whatever. So you got to kind of weigh those two things. I do want to say though, that I don't think those two things are, are mutually exclusive all the time. I think there is that possibility of like focus on writing the thing you love and it can be commercially successful and it doesn't have to be pure luck either. You can still, there is that, that concept of, of right to market, which I think gets muddied a lot, but it's, it's, it's more than just writing, you know, to a fad or writing things that you know will sell. It, it's knowing your market and packaging the book in a way that that market will try it out, even if it's something slightly different from what they might be expecting. I mean, it's okay to, to disrupt expectations every now and then. Just don't go so far too, through that they don't recognize the book. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, it's it's what kind of author are you establishing yourself as? Are you establishing yourself as an author who only writes a specific genre? So when people go to you, they expect that. Or are you an author who writes a specific type of character or a specific type of journey or a specific type of concept or theme? Um, and I think that really the, those are the differences. I mean, I, I put myself in the tagline of dark, strange and queer and that in, t in cases, things like cozy fantasy, because that's more of the queer side, more whimsical side. And I also have these like dark urban fantasy stories. And so uh, the idea is that people are drawn to those books because if they're drawn to me as a person, they know that I will have those types of concepts within whatever genre I go in. Nice. And um, so you're talking about characters and Kaz said her character in this book, her main character was an every woman. And I'm curious, do you write every woman, every men, every person's, what does that mean well, for you? Do you, as an every woman myself, uh, <laughs> I, I find that to be a refreshing <laughs> take on things. I, I like that she did and represents us. So just wanted to put it out there. I'm on board. Oh boy. <laughs> you know, we'll just let that one go. Yeah. So the address the emails to Kevin <laughs> at I, I, I feel like I feel like Kevin's medication timer went off while he was on YouTube. <laughs> we went an hour earlier and it screwed everything up. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I think most people tend to steer, steer clear of the every person just because, you know, like we're, you know, it's drilled into our heads. Make sure your characters ha are unique. They have this particular trait or they have that, you know, like they, they need to stand out. And that's kind of the, the opposite of that. But I could see why that would work, too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Nothing else to add. Okay. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about <laughs> Alien because someone had said that uh, Alien was so successful because it was uh, truck drivers in space. So I'm like, ah, yeah, that probably makes sense, makes sense too. There is that element of things like you do see that. Um, I I, I kind of like that approach in a way because uh, it does kind of turn things on its head. There was a movie I can't even remember called what this movie what the title is. It's brand new. I watched a guy do a review of it, and it's actually borrowing from the Book of Job. 
uh, as its like through line plot. Uh, but that, you know, people, when you think about that, people don't necessarily think about that as being an everyman story, but it, it really is. It was the idea, you know, biblically, it's the idea that this person who's done nothing wrong has to face all these trials and everything. And that's a very relatable. And so if you have, if you're looking for ways to make your characters or your story relatable, casting that every man concept or every woman concept is, is actually a really good tactic. Yeah. And uh, what are your thoughts about writing the style of social media? Is that something that you do? Uh, I've done text messages. I've done um, the, the transcript thing. I, I've done a few times now. Um, and you had brought up that it, it, it's fast as far as pacing goes. And that, that's partly why I do it. Um, but it's a great way to communicate you know, strange information or just offhanded information. Um, I've been finding I'm seeing it a lot more often. I think a trend is kind of happening. Like um, for me personally, if I have phone calls, I put the phone calls in italics or at least a voice on the other end of the line. Yeah. I'm starting to see a little bit more of that kind of thing to tip people off as to what's going on or using a different font for text messages. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's definitely popping up and becoming more more common. I, I I've kind of been toyed with the idea of creating an entire book that's just a, a group text chain, mm-hmm. just to see if I could pull it off. It's been done. Think, People have be done cool. it successfully yeah. too. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I'll say this. I I feel like um, the trend I'm seeing with that uh, is uh, text messaging and other like uh, faceless communication is being used to set a more ominous tone. So if you need you know, if you need the, the the protagonist to be uncertain about what the other character is thinking or what they mean by what they say, if you need ambiguity, then sending a text message rather than having them talking in person does that. Because it what it does is divorce that character from any like body language or or emoting. And so you because we deal with this in the real world, right? Like someone sends you a text message and you get offended, and it may have been just completely benign but you know you took it in this tone and so i'm seeing a lot of writers using i don't know if they're doing it intentionally but the feeling to me is like if the communication's happening over twitter or something or x or whatever um and, or text message that's the kind of conversation we're having is a very top level no depth to it i'm using something like that in in a book i'm working on but it's um and it and it is kind of I, now that I think about it, it is kind of going in that direction where there's supposed to be some ambiguity. There's a little bit of like masking who the characters are. Uh, so that's how I'm, that's how I'm seeing people use that more and more. Hey, she threw something out there. I, I don't want to gloss over it, but if any of you ever submitted a novel for an award before you actually wrote the book? No, no, but that's nope. something no. I wanted to talk about because I know she was talking about a, a UK contest, and I'm just curious about. Well, that's not well. I did pitch wars, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> that's not like that. So yeah, it's but different. are there any? And it's dead now, so that doesn't matter. Are there any like North American contests that you're aware of that you would recommend new authors entering before writing the book? <laughs> <laughs> that's the part that got oh, me. I mean, it, yeah, I, it honestly, like I, I or something. Yeah. It, or, or early on, I chased every award that's out there and, and I submitted to just about everything. And then I actually started winning some and I quickly realized it doesn't move the needle. It doesn't change yeah. anything. Um, most of them are popularity contests, especially if they're created by a particular organization or a writer's group. Um, you know, so like the, the best book doesn't necessarily even win. It's, you know, whoever's got the most people, you know, that are they're yeah. voting that they know. You know, like, so there's a lot going going on there. Um, you know, it, it can't hurt to have the title. You, you can slap it on your book cover or your bio and things like that. It's not going to hurt you in any way. It just, it doesn't help you. It, it takes a lot of energy to actually get it done. Um, I just, I like the fact that she, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend doing it, but like to actually submit a book before it's finished, you know, she basically created that deadline and forced herself to get it done. Yeah. You know, that, that that's a ballsy move, but you know, you got it. You got to appreciate the, the tenacity of doing something like that. Yeah. That terrifies yeah. me. Yeah. And I did like that she won publication and an agent. So it wasn't just like, you know, gold star contest. It was actually a, a really decent prize at the end of that. So that's awesome. Yeah. I just, I suppose you have to make sure that you've got enough time before, between submitting those first 10,000 words and when they're going to ask you for that full novel, just make sure you, you know, you've got more than a week or so to pull that off. Yeah. Or you can do it in a week. Well. I'm just, I'm here to testify. Uh, you can do it in a day, day, right? Kevin? A lot of caffeine. You can do it in a day. Yep. Just saying, some people can do that. 
Not me. Yeah. I am not. I am not one of them. No. Well, now with it, with no. AI, everybody can do that. So it's not even special yeah, anymore. Yeah. I'm glad we got our obligatory drink. In. There you go. Yes, yeah. we are not condoning using AI <laughs> this to write has a book in, in a day to submit to a contest. Anyway, <laughs> what if that contest had a million dollar grand prize? Would you Would you write a book in a day? Yes. Oh, 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 be good. Silence, huh? All right. <laughs> yes, yes, I would. I'm not I, even <laughs> no hesitation. I'd, I'd rather write a good book and earn the million dollars the old-fashioned way <laughs> than try to try to pound it out in a day. Oh, my goodness. And uh, as we devolve into madness. Wait, we didn't even talk about uh, uh, enemies. You know, enemies. do you have enemies that you didn't know you had? Oh, I do. that was a good point. Because <laughs> that was one of the first <laughs> things she talked about. I, I found that fascinating because I, I have had people, I've had people come to me and say, hey, look, you really pissed off so-and-so. I'm like, who is so and so? Like I've never, like I, I, it's literally people I've never heard of, and they're mad at me for things I didn't even realize could be anything someone would be mad about. Like, you know, I said the wrong thing on air or whatever. I mean, I, I can kind of understand some of that, but man, have you guys had that experience? I have a nemesis. You have a nemesis? You have it. <laughs> wow. I do. Does okay. he have a cat? Is it me? Is it Shane? <laughs> it, it, uh, it is Shane. I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, it's a really funny, uh, SW or Shane Miller just randomly decided I was his nemesis. And so it comes up all the time and I still don't really know why, but it is so funny to me that I just let it keep going. I'm sure there's a ton of reasons. I'm probably a shit. That's why, but <laughs> <laughs> JD's my nemesis. Yeah. Moving forward, Kevin. <laughs> oh, I don't know about enemies, but yeah, I've had people told me that I scare them or intimidate them and I was like, Okay. I'm like, I'm the nicest person ever, but sure. <laughs> oh, boy. Jamie, who's up next week? Uh, next week, we've got Tyler Wagner coming on. He's a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and podcast host with about a half million followers on the various social media platforms. He's also the founder of Authors Unite, where he helps authors learn how to become profitable and maximize their impact. Um, so that should be fun. Tyler Wagner. Sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.